Today we're using the Ecological Footprint Calculator, which you can find at footprintcalculator.org. Um, and this is a tool from the internationally recognized Global Footprint Network, which we can see in the top corner here. Uh, their aim is to help end ecological overshoot by making ecological limits, um, also known as how we're currently using too many resources and creating too much waste, central to decision making for people, business and governments. Um, as you can see up the top here, we have this little plane showing us that our Earth Overshoot Day for 2021 this year was July 29. So the first topic that the footprint calculator asks us about is food. So this is inherently asking us about the production, harvesting and the processing of resources for our consumption. So I've already gone ahead and pre-populated my answers for today. So what we can see on the screen is that I happen to be a vegetarian. So that means that I don't eat any meat and I do eat some eggs and dairy. When we go into the details to improve accuracy, one of the things that I'd like to note here is that these items, these foods are organized in a little bit of a hierarchy. So on this end, beef and lamb tend to have some of the highest impacts. Both of these animals um, are hindgut fermenters, which means that they produce quite a bit of methane in their burps and their farts. Also, when you think about the amount of food that it takes to raise a cow or a sheep compared to, say, a chicken or a fish, you can start seeing how those resources are going to rapidly accumulate. And when we're talking about our ecological footprint, we're not just thinking about uh, the grains, the grasses, the other foods that our cows and our sheep are eating. We also have to think about the resources that go into creating that food in the first place. So the fertilizers, the waters, um, all of the machinery used to harvest the grain that then goes on to feed other animals. So I'm just going to move the slider to accurately represent my lifestyle. Um, and one of the other interesting things that we can note here is that eggs, cheese and dairy tend to have quite a different impact than the animals that they come from. So for instance, why do eggs have less of an impact than chicken? Why do cheese and dairy have less of an impact than our cows? And this is simply because of the amount of use that we can get out of these items over an animal's life. So a piece of beef, you only get that once from a cow at the end of its life. It can produce quite a lot of milk and also with chickens, obviously the meat only comes about once, but throughout its lifespan, it can produce a number of eggs. So we're now gonna move on to our next question, which asks us about the processing, packaging, and the travel of our food. So effectively, um, the further your food travels, the more carbon that that's going to create. Um, what this question doesn't ask us about is the type of travel undertaken. So for instance, um, is it by truck? Is it by plane? Is it by ship? Factors can um, impact the ultimate footprint of the food that you're consuming. But of course, if we're asking all of these questions, this would be an immensely long quiz. Um, as to whether our food is unpackaged, Obviously, if it's in packaging, we have to put the effort into producing and manufacturing plastics and cardboards. And it's much we have a much lower impact when we don't use these items. And then in terms of our question about processing, the more we process our food, um, the greater carbon impact that tends to have. So, for instance, there are a lot of fake meats that are now available on the market. So that counts as a vegetarian food. But because of the amount of processing, so the machinery and so on used to actually create a fake meat, this can actually have a similar ecological footprint to simply eating chicken. So it's not making as much of a difference as if you were just going out and eating your vegetable. The next topic that we cover is housing. So we have a number of different options here. So the difference between the top two is obviously whether you have running water or no running water. So this is asking us 
uh, effectively about plumbing. So obviously you have to produce the pipes, so on and so forth, and you have to also maintain this and you have then have access to a resource, namely water. Then the next questions about apartments, duplex, luxury condominium is more asking us about the physical space that we occupy on the ground. This, this calculator also asks us about the materials that our house is constructed with. So this also looks at the production, possibly the harvesting, depending on um, what material you're looking at. So obviously you go about harvesting wood, straw and bamboo. Um, and then we also have to look at the manufacturing for a number of these materials. So for instance, steel is a material, it's a resource that we have to go and mine. And we also require quite a bit of heat to be able to shape that. So that's very energy intensive. And we'd expect that to have a bit of a higher footprint than say um, brick or concrete. And for those of you who are, who are wondering what adobe is, this is effectively um, a mud brick. So if you think about thatched houses, um, you'll probably be thinking of an adobe house. Now, in terms of my selection, my house is made of brick. And the way that bricks are manufactured is that we go and collect clay. It's then shaped, air dried, and effectively gets put into a big kiln. So if you've ever been creating um, statues or vases in your art class, you would have air dried them, put them in a kiln, and then added pigments and so on and so forth to create color. And that's very similar to the processing and manufacturing of brick. This next question asks me how many people live in my household? And this is just a question of simple division. If there are 10 people in my household, that means the resources involved in building my house get to be divided by 10. So that means that for each one of us, um, all the resources are effectively a little bit less impactful because we're we're sharing the impact across a number of us. Our next question, this is um, asking us about electricity and energy efficiency, which is mostly um, looking at our carbon use. And that obviously, that ties in with climate change. And as I'm sure you're all aware, climate change can lead to issues such as sea level rise, more extreme weather patterns, shifting climates and corresponding habitat shifts. Uh, overall, it's not going to be a great time. So it is really important to think about your electricity use and the energy that goes into producing electricity. So obviously my house does have power. It's how I'm powering my laptop at the moment. Um, and it is quite energy efficient, which means that the energy I am using goes further. It ha it's more impactful. And we can see here that some of the factors that can impact your energy efficiency includes the things like the climate in which you live. So if you live in a mild climate or in an area with lots of sunlight, you might not need to use your lights as much. You might not need to use your heating and cooling as much either. Following on from our previous question, we're now looking at renewable sources of electricity. So while my house definitely does not run on wind turbines or solar power, sadly, um, and I also definitely do not own a Tesla, um, we purchase green power. So we buy from uh, electricity companies that use um, renewable means of generating their electricity. And you can also do something called carbon offsetting, uh, which is when the company that you buy your electricity from um, either plants trees or uses other means of carbon capture to replace um, effectively to draw in the amount of carbon that your energy use releases into the atmosphere. Uh, 
this question is looking at waste, but it's not only looking at our waste, it's having a look at our purchasing and consumer tendencies. And we can see this when we go into our improved accuracy section. So it's asking us about the clothes, the appliances, the electronics um, that we purchase and also what we end up recycling. So one of the things I'd like to point out here is that I have said up the top that I use minimal. Uh, I purchase minimal to no new clothing, footwear or sporting goods throughout the year. And this isn't strictly true. Um, so it, what I tend to do is buy all of these goods second hand. So this not only um, extends the life of those items, but it also means that I'm not increasing the demand um, to produce more. And I'm also not using new resources, which is kind of the whole point of our ecological footprint. Um, you'll also note directly underneath here that I often do not buy new electronics and gadgets. And this is because electronics are something that we've only recently started to comprehend the full impact of, as they're made up of so many different smaller components. Um, I'd be very impressed if any of you are able to list a quarter of the resources that can be found in your phone. Um, um, another example of this in terms of looking at manufacturing, processing, and transport. Um, in 2020, the company Apple had at least 205 suppliers, and some of these suppliers have multiple locations. So you can see how tracking specific resources, how they're gathered and how far they travel uh, can get incredibly complex very quickly. And this can actually be quite impactful to your ecological footprint. We then move over to recycling. Um, so if you're ever wondering about what you can and cannot recycle, your best resource is to go to your local council's website. So paper tends to be recyclable in most areas, whereas plastic, hard plastics tend to be able to be recycled. Um, but soft plastics will not generally be accepted by your council. So you can go and um, use specific programs like the red cycle, um, which will actually take the soft plastics and then recycle it for you outside of government bodies like your local council. But of course, um, this question is thinking about what we do use. And as I said before, it's much better for us to try and avoid using these resources rather than use them and then recycle. Because even when we do recycle them, we're then putting it back into the processing and manufacturing um, spaces, and that's going to require more energy. And generally, our recycled products have to be supplemented with new resources as well to make them usable again. The further you travel, the more impact in terms of carbon you're going to have, but also it actually impacts the longevity of your car. So certain parts. Um, might start to fail if you're traveling very long distances. And for instance, your tires can wear out and tires are actually quite difficult to recycle. So uh, your tires are actually quite interesting because they need to have specific programs to be recycled properly. Um, so this topic, which is asking about average fuel economy of the vehicles that I use most often, is asking us this because it's wanting to know effectively the bang for our buck. Also still on transportation is whether or how often you carpool. And similar to housing that we spoke about earlier, this is again division. If I'm going on a 100 kilometer journey and I'm by myself, all of the waste and wear and tear from that falls back on me. Whereas if I have just one passenger, we divide that journey, that 100 kilometers by two, and it's 50 kilometers each. So we're able to share that waste that comes from that trip, which is why I like to carpool a lot, as you can see here. Then, of course, our other option compared to using our own solo sorts of transport is using public transportation. So... 
I use public transportation quite a bit more than the car. Um, it's a very efficient way to travel for similar reasons that we spoke about just in carpooling. A bus can fit and can fit so many more people than your car and then moving on top of that uh, a train can fit even more people so the efficiency there goes up and also you can be using different um, types of energy so for instance a train may not have to be running on your traditional types of petrol Lastly, um, we have flying as its own separate category here because it's actually an incredibly costly form of transport. So in 2019, 2% 2 of global carbon emissions uh, were produced through the burning of jet fuel and taking a long haul flight can actually generate more carbon than what an average person in a number of um, developing countries around the world would produce in this slide. I don't travel 20 hours um, on planes every single year. This is just an average based on the last 10 years or so. Um, I don't think many of us have been doing much flying during the pandemic. So whenever you're in doubt in terms of these questions, when you're doing this for yourself, think about how you averagely use these items. So this is actually our final question. And then we're going to see uh, my ecological footprint on the next slide. We're going to skip to my results. And what we can see here is that if every single person on the planet lived exactly as I do, we would need 3.7 Earth. So we can see that my personal Earth Overshoot Day is on the 10th of April. So despite many of the different actions that I undertake to try and minimize my impact, it's still quite high. And this is partly because of the variety of resources uh, that I have access to in Australia and some things that are quite difficult to control. For instance, most of the houses across the country would be made of brick. Um, most of us have access to running water. Um, and obviously, as a large country, our food can end up traveling quite far. But to see a bit more of a breakdown, we can go here to our see details section. And this gives us a little bit more of a breakdown. So I'd like to draw your attention over to the right of the screen. And we can see that most of my footprint is actually generated by the shelter. So this is uh, the type of house, the materials, the size, and how many people I live with. That is what's having the biggest impact uh, for my personal ecological footprint. And then second up, we have mobility. So the type of transport I'm using, how efficient it is, so on and so forth. Um, there are a bunch of other tabs up the top here that I would absolutely encourage you to look through so I'm also going to come up with another video that explores how these results might differ when we change just one factor.